Area 941 podcast are produced and distributed by Community Powered 94.1 KPFA Radio. Please help support Area 941 at kpfa.org. This is the Bay Area Theater Podcast. I'm Richard Walensky. While we're in the coronavirus lockdown, I'll be presenting weekly interviews with playwrights that I've conducted over the past several years, either when they've come through with a new play or when they've written a novel. Arthur Lawrence, who died in 2011 at the age of 93, was one of the giants of American culture. He wrote librettos, including those for West Side Story, Gypsy, and La Cage Faux, several plays, including The Time of the Cuckoo, His screenplays include The Way We Were, the Ingrid Bergman film Anastasia, and The Turning Point. He also directed several shows on Broadway. On April 7, 2000, Richard A. Lupoff and I had a chance to sit down with Arthur Lawrence while he was on tour for his memoir, Original Story by Arthur Lawrence. In reading this book, I noticed the structure seemed to be the structure of a play, in that, or perhaps even a musical in that you can almost place where the high points are. It's not quite chronological, and it was fascinating to see how you structured it. Am I incorrect in assuming that you were very careful about that structure? You're absolutely right. It did come out like a play, but that wasn't the intention. The intention was that each chapter is springboarded by a play or a movie I wrote. And I wanted to find myself in the work, what I was like then, what Hollywood and Broadway were like then, what the world was like then. And I tried to do it without hindsight. And I was surprised by a lot of it by myself. Some of me is a total stranger to me. And I realized after a while that it was sort of like building up to a curtain, but it was accidental, which is a great way to write anyway. In terms of the structure, you learned structure and you learned writing from radio, and you got your start working in radio. I'd like you to start by talking a little bit about your work in radio and how you learned to write the structure of plays, because dialogue came easy to you. Well, I learned the structure of plays by ridiculous methodology. I was writing a weekly dramatic series, and it was hard to think of plots. So I made a list of the most successful movies, And I listed the successful moments in those movies. And I think I came out from A to about M. And then when I was going to write a story, I would pick B, G, L, and then I would twist them. And that gave me a story. And I realized from that there had to be a structure. It had to build to something. I also think some of this you either have, or as it says in Gypsy, you got it or you ain't. It just came out that way. It was easy for me. Structure has always been easy for me, partly because I have respect for it, and I think almost nobody does today. They don't realize that theater and movies are about telling a story, and they don't tell them. You mentioned uh, in your book a fellow that you describe as Bill Robeson. I assume this is William N. Robeson. Is this the right guy? A very important radio producer, director, and scriptwriter of the 1940s. I'm not sure about the end, but otherwise it's the same That's guy. That's the guy. You're the first person I've ever met who actually knew him. We tell about him. Well, Bill Robeson in one form is in uh, The Way We Were. They even got the trench coat and the mustache, except he was a very dashing guy. I met him actually because... I graduated from college, couldn't get a job, and a girl I knew said Bill Robeson was teaching a course in radio writing at NYU, and he was a big deal, and CBS had an experimental radio uh, show on Sundays. So we went to the course, and he didn't turn up for the first three times, so I said, let's get our money back. It was 30 bucks, I remember. Then he turned up. And he really was like a, some dashing a character actor. He swept in. He didn't walk in. He swept in. And he behaved as though he was trying to seduce everybody in the room with how charming he was, and he was. And then he assigned us a short story to adapt. 
which I saw no point in doing, since I didn't own the, own the material, why waste time? Then he asked us to do an original, and I wrote one, and he liked it, and CBS bought it. Their going price was $100. They paid me 30 the tuition. And Bill sort of adopted me. We hung out a lot, and he must say he drank like a fish, so did I with him. Beef eater martinis, I remember. We ate in a place called Billy's Steakhouse on First Avenue. Great steaks and great drinks. And uh, he was a great ladies' man. And they all thought they were going to get him, and nobody ever did. California got him, and then he disappeared, which is what happens if you go to California. Did you actually go to the studio and work with the actors in the radio? Did I? Yes. No, Bill did. Bill was King Tut. He was the director. I was. I just sat there. I could say things. He really liked me a lot, and he helped me a lot. As a matter of fact, he had a, a guy work for him who was his story editor, who gave me the best piece of advice about writing that I ever got from anyone. I was very facile with words, and I would do transitions with words. And he said, transitions are emotional. And very few people know that. But it's true, and it really helps a lot. Give me an example. Well, you say an example, and I'd say, well, you know, for example, and I go off on something using the word example. That's no transition. Whereas we're talking, and I say, why are you looking at me like that? What have you got against me? We've got a real transition. We've also got a scene going. This was around the same time as you were working at Astoria Studios. No, This no, was no, before no. Astoria. This was before the war. This was just before the war. And through Bill, I got jobs writing for things like, I remember Dr. Christian and the Lux Radio Theater and all this kind of... You went into the army and finally eventually wound up in Astoria. Uh, you describe a scene where George Cukor was working on a film. You were there for the army and John Cheever and Erwin Shaw were there. Did you get a chance to, to talk to them at all? John Cheever, Erwin Shaw, William Saroyan and a guy named Gottfried Reinhardt, who was Max Reinhardt's son, they all lunched at a place called Manny Wolf on 3rd Avenue. I mean, this was everybody was a private. The officers we didn't associate with. I remember Cukor, he was directing an OWI short at a story with Ingrid Bergman. So we all ran down the set. It was a captain in charge of the project named Baker. And he said, clear the set, clear the set. And George said, oh, let the boys stay. Miss Bergman doesn't mind. And he said, I said, clear the set. And George said, listen, Baker, you are a prop boy before the war, and you'll be a prop boy ba after the war. They, they can stay. So we stayed. But the rest of us, we'd have lunch at Manny Wolf's, and uh, I was nobody. They, these guys had all done things. As a matter of fact, they did at Astoria. We're sitting in their offices and write short stories for The New Yorker or Gottfried plotted musicals that he produced on Broadway. It's very, it was quite a war. The war produced a tremendous amount of talent, and not just these men, but also Mailer, Heller, yourself, certainly. What was it, do you think, about World War II? Was there anything special? Was it just a generation writing? That's a hard one to answer. I don't know why. Well, writers have come out of Vietnam. No, I think it was an age. In the age of all of us, we were all, they were older than I was, but we were all pretty young. And there was more freedom then. There were less rules. And New York during the war was fantastically exciting. You have no idea. It was amazing. Just amazing. How so? Well, there were two things everybody wanted. Sex and alcohol, and you could have as much as you wanted without ration coupons. I guess the, the sexual part in your book, uh, you go into uh, a tremendous amount of sexual activity there during the war, and I don't recall ever reading anywhere about all of that that was going on. It, it sounded like the 1970s. Oh, it was better than the 70s, particularly if you were gay 
Actually, I think the Army, the U.S. Army, helped more young men discover they were gay than anything else. They came to New York. You know, Freud says there's a connection between sex and death. And I think there must be. Everybody thought, well, we're going overseas any minute, so let's do whatever we want. And nobody said it was wrong. And everybody did as much as they could, and believe me, there was a lot to be had. And everybody enjoyed it. There was there were no editorials against it. The only thing you would <laughs> would see were training films about getting a dose. And they I remember one with Dana Andrews where he they would show him racing. You're supposed to after you went to bed with somebody, you're supposed to rush down to a prophylactic station and they showed the <laughs> clock ticking, ticking as Dana Andrews ran desperately to get his fix. <laughs> <laughs> what what about uh, raids on bars, anything like that? I mean, that's the later era. That's what we all heard about. Was that going on? Names being taken? I mean, almost as if it was a gay witch hunt. During the war? Not at all. The bars were wide open. I don't know whether they were gay or straight. I mean, the bar, everything was in every bar. I don't recall any kind of particularly gay bars. I mean, I remember the best bar I went to was in a hotel that doesn't exist, the Savoy Plaza. Very fancy. It was the first place I ever saw Lena Horne. And they had this room where she sang, and in the back of it there was a bar where everybody in uniform went. It was really kind of classy but god knows it was a big pickup area <laughs> well what about now your relationship with lena horn this was in an era when racial relations were very much more difficult than they are today yes they were and she um, became one of the closest people in my life and if you want details i'm not going into them <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Through the entire book, you lead us up to telling us what happened between you and Lena that ended it, and you never get there. <laughs> no, maybe if I write another book. It's out of respect for her. You became a playwright, and you managed to get your first play produced, or one of your first plays produced. No, it was my first. What was that very first step? Here you are, you know, you're just a guy, you've never written a play before. Did you approach a producer? I think I've had an absolutely marvelous life. And one of the reasons is I've never thought about not doing something. I thought I was going to write a play, then so I wrote a play. It, I didn't even think of things like that in terms of a challenge. It was something I wanted to do. What was the worst that could happen? It wouldn't be any good. That's no tragedy. And I had talked too much about writing a play, and an actor named Martin Gable, I used to go to parties like mad and get drunk. And he said to me, you're never going to be a playwright. You're always at a party. And he said it at the right moment. And I went home and I wrote Home of the Brave. It has nine scenes and I wrote it in nine nights. And I was in the army writing all this juggling scenes around. There's still a step between writing it and getting it produced. Jerry Robbins, as a matter of fact, found an agent for me. I didn't know anything about this. I think you accomplish an awful lot when you're really naive. And when you're naive, you think you know everything. And I thought I knew everything. I thought the last thing I'd do would be to write a play that took place outdoors and had a same-sex cast. So Home of the Brave takes place out of doors and it's all men. And I thought, oh, the best producer is going to produce it. And... It wasn't the best producer. It was a little round man named Lee Sabinson who said to me, may I have the honor of producing your play? And I thought, who's kidding who? He must know everybody else has turned it down. What kind of an honor? But he produced it. It became a movie, and you mention it, but you don't talk about, did you have any involvement in the movie? None at all. Stanley Kramer produced it, and he said to me, they were turning the Jew, the central character, into what was then called a Negro. And I said, why? He said, because Jews have been done. Uh, what was extraordinary was there were no integrated units in the army at that time. In that picture there is, 
and the audience didn't notice, the critics didn't notice, and certainly the people who made the picture didn't notice or care. You also were involved in a, in a same-sex production of The Women. What about that? I wasn't involved. I saw it. Oh, well, all right. <laughs> all right. Well, I was in a place called Fort Aberdeen to write a training film called How to Carve a Side of Beef <laughs> in seven reels. And I was sure we we're going to lose the war if they were going to make that. And I was wondering, really feeling very lonely on this post. And I saw a sign that said, tonight at the service club, lots of exclamation points. And all, this is true, an all-male soldier cast in John Frederick's hats in Claire Booth's The Women. So... I was both knowing and unknowing. I thought this was peculiar, but I went. And the audience was all GIs, mainly officers and their wives. And they did the play, pardon the word, straight. They took it, did it very seriously. The uh, heroine lamented her husband's infidelity. The little girl had little bumps, and I couldn't believe it. The one character that was played by Rosalind Russell, I think, in the movie, was an obvious a screaming queen, and got all the laughs, and they all went wild. And I remember sitting there, and I thought, are they or aren't they? Does the audience know or don't they know? I didn't know. If I had any sense, I would have gone to the stage door, but I didn't. After working in with plays for a while in New York, you, of course, went out to Hollywood, and you detail very, very intensely what happened out there, uh, including your friendship at first with Gene Kelly and that crowd, and you detail your relationship with the chaplains and their crowd as well, and eventually the blacklist comes. You don't really go into it, but how did people like Gene Kelly... And some of the folks that you hung out with in those days, how did they respond to the blacklist? They all were very disapproving. It was very curious. In the beginning, the whole town was on what I considered the good side. Then the Hollywood Ten went to Washington and was cited for contempt. It was taken to the Supreme Court. Uh, the conviction was not overturned and the tide in Hollywood turned. They all didn't approve, but they all shut up. And nobody wanted to get hurt. It was good guys, bad guys, but the good guys began disappearing very quickly. Did you know Walter Bernstein? Yes. He was a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> he got caught in it. And yeah. did you have any idea before Dimitrik talked that he would? Eddie Dimitrik was very curious. I can remember sitting next to him at one of the innumerable fundraising meetings we had to raise money for his family because we knew he was going to jail. I never dreamed that he would talk. He, he went to jail for a year and then came out and talked. But when he did, I understood why. He could never work unless he talked. So he went to jail for nothing. Someone like Joseph Losey worked. He went to Europe. Yes, well, I went to Europe. Joe was a very individual man. It's, it's all choice. It's all what line are you going to cross and what line are you not going to cross. The blacklist hit Hollywood very hard, and it hit radio very hard. Television was, was not yet part of the mix. But Broadway seems to have escaped. Why was that? Because there are no corporate producers. It's all no. uh, only individuals. Television and movies were produced by corporations and banks. Broadway is totally solo. Yes, you're right. It was. Well, you mean Disney. Well, and SFX now. And yes, yes. Oh God, I guess it's all going down <laughs> the drain. I refuse to believe it. You were able to continue to work in New York, even though you could not work in Hollywood. I was blacklisted. And all the political refugees were running to Europe. I was alone. I didn't have much money. I'd never been. I thought, why not go? And I went and had one of the best times of my life. I know I should have been 
crumbling there, but I didn't. <laughs> a producer named Sam Spiegel met the boat. He offered you a job at much less money. I didn't care. The dollar was, you could buy anything and, you know, you could buy Versailles for a buck in, in France in those days. But how did you get a passport? Oh, well, I had a passport, but they took it away. Jerry Robbins recommended a lawyer. And I did not know at that point that Jerry had informed. Maybe he hadn't. But anyway, this lawyer, it turned out, later worked for the FBI. He went in. When you went into that room with him, he said he was your lawyer, right? Oh, yeah. And then he began asking me about everything I'd given money to and given my name to and written. I would tell him anything. And then I belonged when I was in Hollywood. I was never in the party, but I belonged to a Marxist study group, which was really terrific. I mean, you learned how to read the New York Times. I'm not kidding. It isn't what you think. And he said, who was in the group? And I said, I'm not going to tell you. And he said, I'm your lawyer. I said, I don't care. I'm not going to give you any names. By the way, one of the people in the group was Ava Gardner, which can give you some idea of the group. <laughs> but I wasn't going to tell him that. He got angry, and I suddenly began to get scared. And I thought, the less I tell this man, the better. He grilled me for four hours. Couldn't get a name out of me, thank God. Then he said to me, call the State Department yourself. And I called, and it's too corny. The man who answered was Southern. He said, your name is on page so-and-so of this issue of the Daily Worker. And I said, what does it say? And he said, I don't know. Look it up. Well, it was a review of Home of the Brave. And this kept on for three months. And finally, the lawyer said, write out everything you believe, and we'll send it to the State Department. He said, I'll vet it. So I wrote out everything I believe. He said, I'm going to send it just as is. I said, it'll sink me. He said, no, it won't. You're too idiosyncratic. You couldn't belong to anything. I got the passport. I sailed for Europe. I got on the boat, and there was a wire from MGM offering me a job. Was that Anastasia? No, I didn't take the job. I was going to Europe. I didn't care. How did you get the job for Anastasia? That isn't in the book. Well, I had uh, done worked on Snake Pit with Litvak, whom I loved and who loved me. He was a terrific man. And he wanted me to do Anastasia, which I did in Paris. And I said, on one condition, he was Russian. And I said, listen, this is a fairy tale. And if you do it as a fairy tale, I'll write it. If you're going to do it seriously, get someone else. So he said, okay. And he did pretty much what I'd written, except the very end of the picture. The plotters say to the empress, played by Helen Hayes, who was cast to make Ingrid Bergman acceptable to the American public. The plotters say, what are we going to tell to all the investors? And her line is, tell them the show is over, go home. I wanted her to say that right into the camera telling the whole audience this was a fairy tale. He didn't have the guts to shoot it that way. But still, what did you think of the picture? Oh, it's good. It's fun. It's fun. And, and you know, Ingrid Bergman is Ingrid Bergman. When we gave her the script to read, she said, well, I'm going to buy some vodka and you won't see me for 48 hours. <laughs> <laughs> you came back from uh, Europe and you began work with Jerry Robbins and with Leonard Bernstein and the young... Stephen Sondheim on West Side Story. You detail that quite in intensively. When you were working on it, you had no idea, or did you have any idea that it would get the kind of reaction it did, that people would look at this and say, even though you denied it, that this is a breakthrough? Did When you were seeing it, were you just too paranoid about failing? Oh, no. We all did it because we loved doing it. We were trying to do it as best we could, I thought it would run three months. I didn't care. I think one of the best things about my career is that I have very rarely cared that way. I care about the work. If it works, fine. If it doesn't, go on. That's, that's my profession. And I thought West Side Story was not for the, for, you know, for the world, but it turned out to be. Have you seen the Gap commercials? It's been cut down. Uh, I, no, no, I was just thinking. Now it's on TV every 15 minutes. Oh, it was minutes. the best thing on the Oscars. What about the 1996 touring company of it? Did you catch that? Uh, yes, I did. And some of it was very good. 
I don't know what it was like when it came here because as a traveler around the country, people came and went. But I saw it in Cleveland. And as a matter of fact, I gave them notes. It had a lot of vitality. I kept thinking about that as I read the segment about how the sharks and the jets, jets were kept apart so that they would not socialize. And I kept thinking they didn't do that for the revival, I would assume. They didn't do it for the revival, but you know that's highly exaggerated, all this business. Jerry did do that. They weren't to talk to each other, so they all sat backstage on opposite sides of the room knitting. <laughs> Then after that, you work on Gypsy, and again, you go into great detail. What you don't talk about, and what I'm curious about, are the movie versions, of which there are two, the one starring Rosalind Russell and the one starring Bette Midler. And since you don't talk about it at all in the book, I'd like to ask you, what did you think of those two versions? I thought the Rosalind Russell version was terrible, except for Natalie Wood, who's very good. Otherwise, it's just awful. Bette Midler is my fault. I thought she could probably be a wonderful Rose. And I didn't want it to be made remade as a movie because the screen is either literal or surreal. And in Gypsy, you have a woman in a railway station. She's going mad. And suddenly there's a 40-piece orchestra and she sings a jazzy song. Everything's coming up roses. Well, in a movie, I find that unbelievable. There's a bump. But if you do it on the stage, it's real. So what I wanted was for them to photograph the stage version. And they agreed to do it, and then they didn't do it. And they couldn't control Bette Midler, who played Norma Desmond. And she played <laughs> Bette Midler, but maybe once she played Rose. But it was a great disappointment to me. The cinematography, though, of All I Need is the Girl was superb. I don't know if you remember that. I really don't. Because there again, it's literal. It's a dream effect on the stage. But when you see it on film, it's a stage number. Is that your feeling generally then about uh, film musicals, why yes. most of them don't work? I think one of the reasons that The Wizard of Oz is so wonderful is that it's a fantasy. And so all the musical numbers work. Is there a way, do you think, to make a movie musical that works? I mean, the Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers ones did, but they were all fantasies. They, they Absolutely. They're fantasies. The, the, you know, it's you're taken into the world that's unreal, and it's wonderful. And they should dance, you know, like on the wings of an airplane. Why not? The, the other thing is Gypsy is very real and gritty. That's why it doesn't belong on the screen. On the other hand, most of us, and certainly people living in places outside of large metropolitan areas, will probably never see, unless they travel to New York, uh, a full-fledged production of anything. And for those people who wouldn't get a chance to see Gypsy, this is their only shot. Well, I'm sorry for them. They're not going to see Gypsy. They're going to see a very... Besides, how do you know there won't be a tour? We're going to do... We're going to revive Gypsy. It's going to be done in London first then New York, and then I suppose it'll go on tour. Is there a star for that yet? Yep, Bernadette Peters. One of the reasons I wanted Bernadette is that she's totally unlike anybody who's done it. And you see this little adorable Cupid doll, she can be the biggest killer of them all. And of course, she's got a great voice, sings up a storm. How would you compare her then to Merman? Fortunately, her voice is totally different. Ethel sings like, sang like a trumpet. Bernadette has a distinctive sound that is her own. The other people, even Angela Lansbury and Tyne Daly, sound like shadow versions of Merman. But Bernadette's voice is Bernadette. I've heard her sing some of it, and it's thrilling. You wrote The Way We Were, and you detail again in Original Story by your memoir, the making of The Way We Were, and also about the big cut of all the blacklist material. A little of it sneaks in, and I recall Viveka Linfors being absolutely superb. Does any of that material still exist? Could it ever be put back into the film? Oh, it all exists. They won't put it back. On the DVD, they have some of the outtakes, and they have interviews with Barbara, with Sidney Pollack, and with me talking about the cut. They cut the climax of the picture, which is 
what was disheartening to me was nobody noticed. <laughs> they didn't care. Through your book, one of the great themes of your book is the ways in which directors, actors, playwrights, screenplay writers all interact. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about that. Uh, there's a point when talking about the way we were. You mentioned that you understood that it wasn't your character, female character, and your male character meeting on screen, that it was clearly Barbara Streisand as and right. Robert Redford as, and that always plays a major role. That would imply that the casting director, who's kind of forgotten, plays an extraordinarily large role in the final product. Yes, but in the case of Streisand and Redford, it's the producer. And it's the star system. And when you make anything with a star, you're not going to get the character. The character comes second. The first is the star. That's why they're stars. They have an identity that's all their own. And I think the character in the way we were was very close to Barbara. So I think it's probably her best performance. But it's still Barbara Streisand playing Katie Morosky, Redford playing Hubble Gardner. Have you ever had a situation where, in any of your work, where the performer was so subjugated to the role that you saw in that performer, that person that you saw in your mind's eye writing it? Uh, I don't think so, even with an unknown actor, because when you get a really good actor, they're going to contribute something, and sometimes it's something you never even thought of, and it's very exciting. And everything has to be filtered through the actor. I mean, you write for things to be performed. It's never going to be what you saw in your head. What you have to try to do is see if, it's, if the idea is going to come through. That's the best you can hope for. How about as a director? What kind of control do you think you have at that point? A director has a certain amount of control, but it's still, it's the actors you choose. I think 60% of directing is casting. If you've got a good cast, you're going to come off well. And if you don't, you're stuck. Is there any chance then with a great cast that something like Do I Hear a Waltz could turn out well? Not with that score. One of your works that you write about writing with great passion is Jolson Sings Again. If you would just give us an insight into when that idea first came to you and how it evolved into first the, the disaster it was and then the success that it became. I wanted to write about the witch hunt and the blacklist because it was a seminal period in my life. The title comes from Larry Parks who became a star by playing Al Jolson, and I guess somebody dubbed the songs. But anyway, he was also the first actor to inform. And when he informed, the newsboys on Hollywood Boulevard said, hawking their papers, Jolson sings again. So there's the title. And when I wrote it, I thought I knew exactly how I felt about informing, which was that it was despicable and inexcusable. And then I began to examine myself. And I had, after all, worked with Jerry after I knew he was an informer. I'd worked with Kazan after I knew he was an informer. And that's validating them. So I realized it wasn't as black and white as I thought, which was better because it's more interesting. And the play began to change from what I thought it would be. It was a disaster, interestingly enough, because of the way it was cast the first time around in Seattle. There were four roles, and three of them were totally miscast because of an exigency of the situation. And then somebody read it and wanted to do it again, and, well, I rewrote. And it's a whole long story, but I'm very glad that I did, and, and I, I have great hopes for it for the fall. It's coming to Broadway? It's coming to off-Broadway. Broadway is not for American plays. It's for English plays. <laughs> I'd like to ask you about your feelings about Broadway. I know that you uh, you called Sondheim a whiner for criticizing Broadway. Who told you that? Oh, it was in the Chronicle. 
Well, I guess I did. <laughs> um, it strikes me. I didn't say for criticizing. I simply meant he's had so much success. And the theater, when I came into the theater, they said it was dying. And it was. And it still is. It's closer. But that's you don't give in to that. You keep trying. And Steve's written a new show. Hasn't gone too well. That's no reason to quit. If you love what you do, you keep going and you hope. And you don't let Disney or anybody else push you out of the way. What I've had to find out, I carried on a crusade to get new American plays on Broadway. I realized it wasn't going to happen. Well, then you do it off Broadway, but you do it. And there's also now venues, uh, nonprofit venues, uh, Playwrights Horizon and others that can get things started. Yeah, I have a play of mine done at Lincoln Center now. That's a revival, The Time of the Cuckoo. But they're doing another new play called Two Lives, the season after this at Lincoln Center. But that's off Broadway. Speaking of Time of the Cuckoo, talk about Shirley Booth. Shirley Booth was a sad lady. She was a lovely comedian. She had a flaw as an actress that she didn't need to have. She wanted to be liked. And if you want to be good at anything, you cannot care whether you're liked. You have to do what you feel is right. Shirley was afraid. And that prevented her from being what I think she should have been and could have been, which is one of the great actresses of our time. But she was scared. When she became Hazel the Maid, was that just a total sellout? Well, listen, people want money. They want to live. What Hazel did to her when she came back to the theater, she couldn't act. I think the muscles atrophy when you play one of those television sitcoms over and over, and you're doing the same thing, and you just do it by reflex. Then you get to the theater, and you don't know what to do anymore. And she did two failures and then retired to Cape Cod. Did you ever meet Garbo? Yes, I met Garbo. What was she like? She was funny. She said, uh, I remember once saying, it's too hot to speak English. <laughs> she uh, also referred to herself as the old boy or the old man <laughs> at the time. <laughs> I met her in Hollywood at a party. George Cukor used to give the most marvelous brunches. You know, there were real stars in those days. There are very few today. I mean, there's Michelle Pfeiffer, God knows, who to me is the epitome of everything a screen actress should be. But there are very few. And I was sitting by Kate Hepburn and in came Garbo. And I said, oh, and I met her. And I said, well, I can leave Hollywood now. And she said, why? I said, I met Garbo. And she got insulted. She said, I like that. She was furious. Then Garbo moved to New York, and I moved back to New York, and I saw her in the street one day, and I went up to her and said hello. And then what? What do you say to Garbo? You know, how are you, Greta? You know, you just don't. <laughs> no, I don't know. So the, the conversation was two sentences, and that was that. You've been now working, and you're still working, still writing plays, still skiing. Is there any secret to staying young? Caring. Caring about everything there is to care about. And also realizing, uh, this is going to sound, you know, like some tract, but if you really look around, just look out the window, life is really tremendous. And just grab it. Grab it by the throat and live as hard as you can. Arthur Lawrence, what are you working on now? Uh, I'm, when I come back from here, I'm finishing I'm in the last scene of a play called Claudia Laszlo. And I say that name and people say, wait, just who was she? I remember her. Well, they don't because it's made up. It's unlike anything I've ever written, except I don't think I've ever written the same thing twice anyway. But I'm having a good time with this one. Bernadette Peters did go on to play in a successful revival of Gypsy in 2003, and Patti Lapone essayed the role in another successful revival in 2008. Before he died, Arthur Lawrence agreed to yet another film of the show, this one starring Barbara Streisand. That project is currently in limbo. In the last two years of his life, he not only premiered two new plays, one in New Jersey and the other off-Broadway, but also directed on Broadway, West Side Story. I'm Richard Walensky, and see you next Sunday 
for another edition of the Bay Area Theater Podcast. Mm-hmm.